That's a testimony. When I look back, I can see God's hand. Yeah. When you're in the middle of stuff, sometimes you can't see it, but when you look back, yeah. he's always there, always guiding, always molding. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I don't know if anybody knows this, but I shouldn't even be here. When I was a youngster, I was running wild. God just let me do what I want as long as I wanted to do it. And um, I almost killed myself drinking, riding motorcycles. I was in Arizona and I got an accident. I hit a median in the middle of the road, probably going 60 miles an hour. I hit it so hard that it snapped my neck and knocked me unconscious. I flew over two lanes of traffic and landed into two lanes of oncoming traffic on the side of my head. It fractured my skull, broke all the bones around my left eye, broke my jaw, broke my nose, broke some teeth. And as God would have it, I almost landed on the hood of two paramedics coming home from work. <laughs> they jumped out, called in a helicopter. That's and, wonderful. And if you look, the plastic surgeon that put my face back together, you can't really even the tell that anything happened. Oh. Yeah. Which one? Amen. So Thank I'm going to jump around Jesus. a little bit. Um, but I'll bring it back around. The last three to four years has been crazy, and it started right here. My wife and I, the church we go to, it's more conservative. It's organ music and hymns, and we love music. We love to worship. So Kellen said, let's, let's go to some other churches and uh, worship. I was like, oh, we, we can't do that. We're going to hurt our pastor's feelings if we go someplace else. But he said, you know what? We'll, we'll just go. We'll visit. We'll come back. So we kind of became guerrilla Christians. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you go everywhere. And church is wherever you are. That's funny. I think I invented that term. So the first place we went was Walnut Hill in Waterbury. Yeah. And the first guy we ran into is right there, Ed Vyches. He took us by the hand and introduced us to everybody in the church. And it was such a great day. And before that even, we were here at Joseph's house. Kellen and I used to be the, we go to church on Sunday and then we stay in and that's our church. We did our thing for the week. Stay at home Christians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somehow we came here and there was a pastor from Africa speaking. And his whole sermon was about, are you going to be a cheerleader or a cheerleader? Are you gonna sit in the seat? Are you gonna do something? Are you gonna stand up for our, our Lord? Hallelujah. And at the end of the service, he had an altar call and we went up and he prayed over us and he anointed us with oil. And he said, I can't tell you how or when, but your life is gonna change. And let me tell you, <laughs> <laughs> the Lord blew our lives up. Like from the point we met Ed Vyches, he connected us to so many people. Um, Ed said, you have to come see these guys that are playing on the street in Waterbury. It was Gary and Ed Randis from Revival Sound. And the Holy Spirit was just moving there that night. And we were so filled with the Spirit. And at the end of it, Ed goes, do you play anything? And I said, I play bass, guitar. He goes, you play bass? You want to play with us? I said, okay, which is not like me. But I I don't like to be in front of people. I don't like attention. I don't like speaking. <laughs> Miracle, right here. <laughs> so I was supposed to try out for Revival Sound. And um, the day I was supposed to go to Ed's house, I was physically sick. Satan was waking up in the middle of the night saying, you're not good enough to play with those guys. Mm -hmm. Just, oh, no, can't do it. So I'm sitting on the deck that day, and Kelly goes, what's wrong with you? He goes, he goes, your face is all red. I said, my stomach is flipping. My blood pressure is like going through the roof. But I said, you know what? I know what's going on here. It's Satan. He's trying to keep fear in me from doing this. I said, I don't care. I'm going. If I don't play one right note, I'm going. <laughs> so I got in there, sick as I was, drove down to Ed's house. And as soon as we played one note together, it was like a spell was broken, like we'd always played together. It was the strangest thing. So right after I started playing with Revival Sound, um, we felt that the, the brotherhood of the band was even more important than music. So we used to meet, and uh, we got around a campfire one night, and uh, Jacob, what's his last name? Barber. Jake, Jacob Barber was going to preach the next day, and he was around the fire with us, and he was sharing what he was going to talk about. He was talking about how they train elephants, how they 
drive a stake into the ground and they chain him to it. And the elephant will fight and pull and you know, do whatever they can do to get away. And eventually it breaks their spirit. They know they cannot escape the chain. And after that point, you can put a string around their leg and they won't try to get away. And he talked about Paul and Silas in prison, in chains. And they sang and they prayed and the chains fell off and the prison doors flew open. Yes. And where'd he go from there? Oh, I don't remember, but. I want to talk about your heart. <laughs> New one. Okay, that, that's another one. Let me just finish this one. I'll go to the heart. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So the very next morning, I'm in my kitchen and I'm starting to cook breakfast. And, <laughs> and God just shows up. He starts talking to me. And, and he used Jacob's words. He said, I took the chains off you. You put them back on. Has anybody here seen The Woman King? It's on Netflix right now. I haven't seen it yet. At the end of it, the words just, the Holy Spirit used the movie to, to talk to me. He said, if you want to hold the people in chains, you must first convince them that they are meant to be bound. Ooh. So we get that on our heads. We join with the enemy and we start becoming our own oppressor. So God was convicting me. He's like, I took them off. You put them back on. And he said, uh, remember the 10 lepers I healed? Only one came back. Whew. He said, you're not the one that came back. He said, why aren't you praising me? Mm. I took the chains off you. I freed you. You're living in shame. You're living in fear. He said, start praising me. Start telling people your story. So I immediately called up my new bandmates. I figured this is gonna be the shortest uh, stint of band ever <laughs> to tell them my testimony. I called up my pastor, started telling people at work. But you know what, it's died down again. Uh, okay, that brings us up to here. Um, as I lived my life, what I thought success was, was money, prestige, you know, a good job. I was chasing money. Um, I was married and had two boys. And um, I was trying to be the perfect husband, the perfect father. Um, I started an insurance business. I'm trying to provide for all of them and, and I'm denying for myself, there's like no recreation. Everything's just work, work, nose to the grindstone. And um, that didn't work out too good either. The business failed. I was probably like $25,000 in debt by the time I stopped. And I took a job working from 7 at night to 7 in the morning at BD out in Canaan. And within a year, I'd work myself like as high as I could go blue collar. They put me in their tool room. And there just happened to be a man in there that was a Christian, and he took me under his wing. And he started sharing his faith with me. He started me reading the Bible, just hanging out. You know, he was loving me. And it was, it was an awesome time. And then uh, one day, we had a bulletin board back by the coffee. And somebody put up a flyer that Charlie Alzheimer, I don't know if anybody's ever heard of him. He wrote for Deer and Deer Hunting Magazine. He's like a photographer, author that he was going to be putting on a game dinner at Sheffield Chapel, and he was gonna be doing a slideshow on deer and outdoors. So I've always been an outdoorsman, like the woods is church to me, nature, I see God in it. So a lot of guys there hunted, and we said, okay, we're gonna go. We all get all excited. My, my ex-wife was into photography, she was gonna go. <clears throat> It was March 14th, 1999. It starts snowing. It's a Sunday night. Everybody backs out. So I'm looking at Thanks' wife, and she goes, I can't get a babysitter. I'm not going. I remember standing in my living room just feeling so torn. I don't even know. I didn't even know why. I was miserable. So I said, you know what? I'm going. I jumped in the van. I drove to Sheffield. 
and I couldn't figure it out. This, this was a free event. They had like a nationally known speaker, a free game dinner. I was like, what's the hook? So I get there and the people were so nice. The food was fantastic. The fellowship was great. I didn't even know what fellowship was back then. That, that word didn't. <laughs> and at the end, Charlie comes out and he does a slideshow and the pictures were beautiful. And then at the end, he pulled a quick one. He gives his testimony. I was sitting in the front row and it was like the finger of God came down. No, oh. it was so personal. Charlie was talking about the, the void, the hole in your heart, and how we try to fill it up with sex and drugs and alcohol and just whatever, anything but God. And God had let me run for so long by that point. I was like, you know what, God? I surrender. I am so tired of doing it my way. So that was the night I gave my life to Christ. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. It was, it was very emotional to me. I wanted to talk to the speaker, but he's like a minor celebrity. You couldn't get around him. So, plus, it was kind of a mess. <laughs> so I got in the car. I drove home, and it was kind of confusing. I knew something happened. I didn't know what had, had happened. Um, but there was like a weight that had been lifted. And from then on, I was just like set on fire. I was afraid I was gonna scare my wife. I was a Jesus freak. <laughs> I couldn't get enough of the Bible. I just, I think I went 10 years without missing it. I mean, I was devouring it, but I didn't know that God was preparing me. So I kept reading and kept talking with Ben and things just got better and better and better. Um, I was working, I was a machinist in the factory. I was working at a bandsaw. I was cutting metal. God shows up the most random times with me. <laughs> Sometimes I'm sanding the deck. This day I was working at a bandsaw. This was the first time like, I really felt God. And I think I know why they say no one can stand in front of God and live is it'd be too much for our nervous systems. It was like a short, it was like he touched me, a knowing all this information and love all at once. I'm standing at the bands on, I'm like in tears crying. And he also, it was just strange. He wanted me to rebuke a pastor. And I don't know if you know me, but I hate confrontation. It comes from my youth. That I do everything in my power to avoid confrontation. So I went to the bathroom, I'm a mess, I pulled myself together, I told Ben what's going on, and uh, I thought, ooh, you know, pride started coming already. I went and I, I did talk to this pastor, I spoke the truth in love, and um, I, I thought, oh, I'm God's boy. I remember actually thinking this, Satan, you can't touch me now. <laughs> I'm God's boy, I'm pretty proud, and no matter what, he's gonna, he's gonna keep me. But you know, I, I had I had certain secrets, dirty little secrets, still that I hadn't confessed. And I remember walking around. I used to walk around the factory at lunchtime. And I remember walking one day, and I'm I'm praying as I'm walking. I'm thinking, Oh Jesus, I want to know you more. I want to feel what you felt, do what you do, and. I'm just asking, come on, bring it, you know? I want to know you. And it was a dangerous prayer. I had no idea what I was saying. I'm thinking just the good things, the power, the might. But um, there's a lot more to Jesus than that. He, he suffered. He was humiliated. Um, what they did to him, spit on. And around the same time, I kept hearing this little voice in the back of my head saying, tell her. <laughs> and I knew exactly what it meant. God was telling me to confess to my wife what I had done. See, my sin of choice was sexual immorality. Um, yeah. And I cheated on her, lied to her, 
and worse. Just like with anything, drugs, alcohol, it's the love, the mitten returns. That had always been my drug of choice, my opiate. And I'd gotten pretty deep into things and pornography and just to reach that. The only time I felt like I was alive was when I was sinning and I didn't even know it was sin then. I felt like, I don't know. Thank you, Jesus. As I went on, it was like it was being pulled apart. I was like, I'm doing things I don't want to do. And then when I'm done doing them, I'm filled with remorse. It's like Satan making you dance like your marionette. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> Not fun. So the, I probably heard that three or four times. A little whisper, tell her, tell her. Tell her. And in my head, I'm thinking, I can't. If I tell her what I've done, she's going to leave me. And looking back, if I confess, it might have saved me a lot of problems. <laughs> so it was um, Veterans Day, November 12th, 2002. I'm in my house, and the phone rings. I pick up the phone, and I find I, I'm going to be arrested. Boom, there goes the pride. <laughs> My whole world blew up. I can't even begin to explain the feelings, the anxiety, the fear. Like All my worst nightmares are coming true, and they're coming out. Um, see, when I was a kid, I, I don't know if it's a blessing or a curse, but I have a really long memory. I can remember being like two and three years old. I tell people that's how I think of God. I remember getting picked up and carried to bed and being held. Uh, I remember being at the 1964 World's Fair and being carried to the car. <laughs> so I remember innocence. And I remember that I don't know if you know anything about the languages of love, but touch was my thing when I was a child. And then um, one night there was inappropriate touch, and it changed that. Then it, from then on, it was confusing to me. And not too long after that, I was shown hardcore pornography. I don't even think I was in fourth grade yet. I can, to this day, I can remember the name of the magazine, what was in it. And it, it made an impression on me. And that's when the change came. Um, the unhealthy interest in sex. So as I grew with that, um, and again, then my family there wasn't a lot of communication. Uh, my parents loved me. My dad was a World War II veteran. He drove a tank with General Patton. Didn't get a scratch on him on the outside. He was, he was kind of messed up in the inside. So um, I just kind of went with the flow. It was like a kuna matata, the Lion King. Go with the flow, but still, before I was saved, I was like trying to fill that hole just floating, drifting through life. So when I got that call, I called, I had started going to the church where I got saved. The pastor's name was Chet Howes. So I used to drive 45 minutes to go to Sheffield every weekend for probably three years. And you know, we got to be really good friends. So when I got that call, the first thing I did was call Chet. And he came down, he prayed with us out, and he lived in the Massachusetts, so it was no little thing for him to come. He spent time with us, you know, held us together while everything was blowing up. And uh, later on, we were talking, he goes, you know, Bob, this is going to come out in the paper, and people are going to ask me, 
You knew this was, he was here and he'd say anything. See, it was a sexual offense. I had inappropriate contact with a, a minor. And this was gonna come out in the paper, so he goes, will you do a testimony? I said, oh, I don't even know why I said it. I said, if I knew say yes, this is a, an open confession, but I said, yeah, I'll do it. And he said, I've never had this happen, but there's two other men in the church at this time that are, have sexual sin, they wanna confess. So they set the day for that. And the day comes and nobody shows up but me. <laughs> so here I am in the church, I gotta go talk about my deepest, darkest secrets. And it was like God lifted me up, carried me up to the front of the church, sat me down and the words just came out. So I confessed what I'd done. And afterwards people came up and they hugged me and it was amazing how many people had similar stories had either, you know, or been a victim, mostly victims. And at first it seemed like everything was going great, but um, I don't know, the sexual sin, a lot of people now would rather you be a murderer than a sexual offender. So when God talked to me about being a leper, I really understood that. The shame, because even after Jesus healed the leper, I know some of them probably still felt like they were lepers, being outside of the camp, you know, the shame that comes with it. They probably just wanted to disappear. And I kind of felt the same way too. Um, so that a stink started in the church, meeting started, uh, people started showing their true colors. And they didn't think I should be in the front of the church with a worship team. They thought maybe I could cut the lawn. Yeah. And it really got me like the, the guy that was running the worship team pulled me aside and just really read me out. And I, I love this guy. So I was in the middle of a church split and turned on by half the church. The pastor stood by me. We're still friends to this day. Um, the church ended up, actually, he ended up leaving. He said, we're going to spend so much time trying to fix this that we're not going to be doing any ministry. So he actually left and went to Ohio and pastored at another church. He came back long enough to marry Kellen and I, though. So once everything was out, I didn't want any more lies in my marriage. I wanted nothing but truth. So I confessed to my wife everything I had done. And I'd think I was done and something else would pop up. And I would tell her, something else would pop up, I'd tell her. And I don't think there was wisdom in that to the point, I think it got to be so much, it was like the straw that broke the camel's back. I'd done so much damage. So um, I was arrested. I was out on bond for three years. I guess the longer you're out there not getting in trouble, it's supposed to look better. I had hired a lawyer and he was telling me to take 10 years. And I called up my best friend's dad and was talking to him. And he, he said, I, I want you to talk to somebody. And he gave me a number and told me to go talk to uh, another lawyer in New Haven. <clears throat> so I went and I, I actually, when I look back at it, it was a testimony to this lawyer because he heard, when, they, when I did my testimony, they taped it. He said, you know, next time keep your pain private. <laughs> so he heard my testimony and he took the case. He's, and uh, he wanted $25,000 to represent me. And my friend's dad said, don't worry about it. I got you. Thank you. Mm. So it dragged on and on for three years. Um, and finally came to this, um, it's like a Johnny Cochran lawyer. Instead of 10 years, he got it down to four years. Four years served, um, 11 years suspended, and 15 years of probation. So I said, okay, that's the best deal I'm gonna get, let's, let's go. 
So, um, being convicted of a crime is like the weirdest thing. It's surreal. I said goodbye to everybody, my kids, you know. And the day I was supposed to get convicted, somebody called it a bomb scare. So I had to get postponed again. They gave me another day. Same thing. All this. It's like putting a gun to your head and pull the trigger. It got says it's a snowstorm came in and they had to move it ahead again. So I'm waiting. <laughs> Finally, the third time, uh, I went to Litchfield Superior Court, was convicted and uh, lost my freedom. And you don't realize what you have until it's gone. When you can't even go to the bathroom by yourself, doors opening. You, know, you can't open a door by yourself. But it's also a part of life you can't understand. It's like having children. Until you've been there, you really can't understand it. Um, it was the worst thing that ever happened to me. It was also the best thing that ever happened to me. See, I guess to be used, God has to break you down. And he did. He broke me, threw me in the fire, refined me, burned off all, not all the impurities, but he burned off a lot of impurities. And the people I met there, some of it was a shame they were there. And some it's a shame they're ever getting out because there's no remorse. But I met people whose own fathers put cigarettes out on their arms. Um, men whose mothers were prostitutes or abused by the Johns. It was crazy. God also answered prayers there. I prayed to him about music, being a better musician and music. Well, it, God works in mysterious ways. I started playing in the prison band. <laughs> The first time I ever played in a band was in prison. Um, I played for the Spanish church. I played for an all gospel church. Anytime I could, I was, I was out playing music and singing with my brothers. So time, time flew by. And while I was in there, um, my wife divorced me. Uh, and I got mad at God. But he showed me that I put her above him. He said, I created her, but you put her first. So it was a tough time. Um, I was released. I served my four years, got out in December 16th of 2009, and I had nothing. No place to go. They put me in a sober house. <clears throat> Trying to find work as a convicted sex offender is not easy, but God opened up a door. I was able to find work, um, and I was trying to reconcile with my ex, get my family back together. I know what God says about family, and that's when I got like mad. I turned my back. I knew he was there, but I said, you know what? I'm not talking to you. I know what you said. You're not helping me here, but we have free will. She had free will. I'd done so much damage that the best thing I could do was leave her alone. Um, I had tried dating a few women that I had met at work and I, I wouldn't touch anybody or anything before they knew my story and when they found out it was like I was unclean again actually I've had, they were crying and when they found out they, so it really made me feel dirty um, and then I met Kellen <laughs> And we went out, and it was like we'd known each other our whole lives. We met at a Dunkin' Donuts, we talked, we went to dinner, and we've been inseparable since. I remember standing in the driveway before anything got serious, and I told her my story, and she just looked at me and said, okay, we don't ever have to talk about this again. <laughs> wow. Wow. Hallelujah. Oh. And that's when I ended my fit with God. I realized that I was like a spoiled child laying on the ground, kicking my hands and feet. And the whole time he, he was standing there, I, arms wide open. Okay, when you're done throwing your tantrum, get up, because I still love you. Yes, amen. So we brought Kellen, and now we're married. Thank you, Jesus. 10 years ago, I had 
When I get out, I had nothing. I'm married. I have a, a home. I have a family. Amen. Hallelujah. I am so blessed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amazing grace. Like the most precious gift is people. Amen. And he's brought so many wonderful people into our lives. We are rich. <clears throat> and he's faithful. Sure, yep. It costs a lot. He broke me down, but he's also patched me back up. He's built me up. He's encouraged me the whole way. Surround me with people that have nurtured and encouraged. And when I heard um, Joey Russo spoke here, was it last Tuesday? Yeah, I missed it. What he said about titles really struck home with me. Like being labeled a sex offender. A lot of people see it. It's actually the best thing that ever happened to me. See, God removed self-righteousness from me. He removed any chance of me, you know, before I was saved, saying, you know, I'm basically a good person. Because that was my thing. As long as I didn't kill anybody, I was basically a good person. <laughs> so now I look back and the whole thing's been a blessing. I thank him. Thank you, Lord. Amen. for being there and allowing me to go through the things that I've gone through. He's merciful. Oh, I just want to read one last thing to you. We were at a worship ceremony one night, and I usually just worship. For some reason, I just picked up my phone, and I, I just started writing. And Kellen was getting annoyed with me because she thought I was texting somebody. <laughs> but I was writing, like the Holy Spirit was talking to me. And what I wrote was, uh, the greatest act of mercy is when I fell on the rock and was broken. He removed my self-righteousness. He opened my eyes to see the filthy mess that was me. Just one sin would exclude anyone from his perfect love forever. What chance did I have? Yet even while I was enemy, he made a way. Mm -hmm. As impossible as seemed, he took my well-deserved punishment on himself. He ransomed me. Oof. He calls me his friend. <laughs> he calls me his own. He said, this one is mine. No greater love. He laid down his life. He didn't leave me there in the mire. He wiped me off, took me by the hand, and said, walk with me. We're going to walk this out together. Thank you, Jesus. And he, he hasn't failed. He's always been there, and he always will be there. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. So if you're carrying anything, like some of these things from childhood get in deep, bitter roots. Sometimes we don't even realize they're there anymore. If you're carrying anything, speak to somebody. Speak to me. We'll pray for you. Don't carry it anymore. God doesn't want you to carry it. No shame, no guilt, no condemnation. That's not of him. So thank you for listening to me. Yeah. Love you all. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you want to? Thank you, Jesus. Close this out?